Good afternoon. My name is Raj Vinakota. I'm an executive vice president at the Aspen Institute, uh, leading the new division focused on working uh, with young people ages 14 to 24 uh, in a direct fashion. Uh, but this afternoon isn't about me. It's about uh, the person to my left, Lejeune Montgomery Tebron. And since you all, I assume, can read and are comfortable reading, I'm not going to tell you anything about our bio except the one question I asked her before we came up here, which was, What's something that you'd want everyone to know about you um, that isn't necessarily in that bio or isn't explicated? And she said that one of the things that's, that she feels best about is the Courageous Leader Award that she got in 2015 from the White Men as Full Diversity Partners uh, program, which awards two to three awards per year uh, to people who take courageous stands as leaders in this, their organizations to push forward on these issues of diversity which I think is perfect to not only explain you, but also to lead into our conversation this afternoon. Because it took courage for the Kellogg Foundation to take this leadership view and leadership perspective on a racial equity lens in everything that you did. Um, and we're gonna talk about that uh, for a while and then have some questions at the end so that the audience can also uh, be part of this. Um, so thank you for being here. You're welcome. Thank you You're for welcome. inviting me. And, and good afternoon, everyone. Let's just jump in, like, what was the motivation and what's the case for taking this kind of perspective in the work that you do? Yeah, it's, I think the case goes back to our mission, uh, and it was a mission to improve the lives of all vulnerable children, uh, not only in the United States, but in Latin America and the Caribbean and Southern Africa, Brazil, all of the places where we were funding. And the bottom line was we wanted to remove the barriers that children faced in their lives so that all children could thrive. And my personal passion starts uh, a little bit from how I believe I got to the foundation. And I've been there 31 years, so I started in 87, and I was hired by a president at the time, uh, Dr. Norman Brown, who had decided that he wanted the Kellogg Foundation to reflect all of those communities uh, that we were serving. And he didn't believe at the time that the foundation fully reflected uh, all of those individuals and he began to diversify the organization. So 31 years ago I was at the beginning of that and I believe now that he has passed on uh, that I'm carrying that uh, baton for him today. Tell me, what does that look like in your practice and the work that you support? It, and you know, I'll give you a, a clear example uh, in our local community of Battle Creek, Michigan. Um, we have been very clear that we wanted to support equity, racial equity, and looking at how racial equity shows up in our education work, our health equity work, our economic development work, and in particular in our education work, the community is a very interesting community in that it has five school districts for 50,000 people. So those are very small school districts. But they were created based on out-migration as people moved out into some of the suburban areas and what was left in the core was a school district, Battle Creek Public Schools, that ended up being predominantly children of color uh, and not performing well at all. Uh, and actually, none of the school districts were performing well, but the urban Battle Creek Public Schools was faring even worse. And so when you think about how we fund in Battle Creek, uh, for many years, what we would do is we would give all the different districts grants. And so it was kind of equity, meaning everyone gets an equal part. Uh, but a couple years ago, we conducted a study. We hired the New York University to, to look at equity across the educational system in Battle Creek. And what they determined was there was a pattern of this out-migration uh, that was actually leading to very significant disadvantages in the Battle Creek Public Schools. And they looked at lack of resources, lack of, of being able to compete based on 
all of the resources going out to these uh, suburban districts. And based on that study, they identified the, the racial inequalities that existed in that structure. And so for the first time ever in Battle Creek, Michigan, instead of giving grants to every school district, we gave one grant to the Battle Creek Public Schools for $50 million in order to disrupt those patterns that were leading to those children of color being disadvantaged in that school district. So part of this is... Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So part of this is about the equity and, uh, issue. And so you put more money into one place. You're also trying to disrupt, as you said. So how does that money use differently than it used to be? It was used very strategically. So the first thing uh, that uh, we did was we looked at uh, the leadership, because we know leadership is critical, and that's one of our uh, uh, very, we call it our DNA, but the way the Kellogg Foundation looks at any investment opportunity is we look through a lens of racial equity, of leadership, and of community engagement. And in this case, this grant reflected all three of our DNA. But we wanted the leadership in the school district to be a part of this. Uh, and then we actually worked with the school district and uh, everything we know about education from all of our funding across the United States. We wanted every best practice possible to be a part of this transformation. We called it a transformation because what we know is you can't just do a silver bullet activity here or program here. It needs to be comprehensive and you must make sure that very many aspects are taken care of. So we funded teacher quality. We put teacher coaches in every classroom. We provided resources for the school district to actually compete and its recruitment of teachers. In the past, because it was a, a very uh, low resource school district, they could never hire teachers until count day, basically. And then they would get the teachers that were left. Uh, because of these resources, they actually were able to recruit in the April time span when everyone else and all the other districts were recruiting so they could recruit high quality teachers. The teachers were given coaches. We com created communities of practice. They changed the curriculum to common core standards. They hadn't changed their math curriculum in decades. They never had the resources, and the way the teachers would even try on their own would be to just go to the internet and piece together curriculum. Um, and what we wanted was them to have the best quality curriculum there, and so that needed funding. How'd you bring the four other districts that didn't get the 50 million along? Yes, so this is a very interesting story. Um, you don't just do this kind of work without really attending to the entire community. And so uh, even before the year of this particular investment, we had started working in the community at least a decade on issues of racial equity. And we actually hired the organization White Men as Full Diversity Partners to come to Battle Creek and host dialogues around equity with all of the CEOs and leaders in the community. And so we were building this platform and an environment, as we call it, that could embrace this concept. And so by the time we actually made the grant, um, and we weren't sure because, you know, you never know, but we had done all this seed work and many people in the community had been trained. And so um, when the grant was made, we thought people, would, the other districts would be really upset. But instead, because of this grant and the work that we did, the other four districts' boards met for the first time ever together and said, we have been complicit in this structural racist uh, education system, and we no longer want to be a part of it. And so the other four districts actually came together and talked about how they could manage choice better so that all school districts, including the Battle Creek Public School District, would fare well in this system. Uh, one of the main things that disrupts an urban system, not just Battle Creek, what we're finding is across the country, is they can't predict enrollment. 
and enrollment in the, the choice process becomes very unstable. And so each year they, they struggle. And part of the grant that we gave them was you need a strategy about enrollment. And for the first time, they said, as they trace back the patterns, the best way to guarantee enrollment is to ensure that your kindergartners are secure and having an experience that can be replicated. And so what part of our grant was to fund a summer kindergarten, pre-kindergarten. And they uh, invited a core group of community members to participate in that. And they stabilized enrollment for the first time in about five or 10 years. So it sounds like it, there's at least two things at play here. Number one is it took you 10 years before you even made the gift. So there's a lot of upfront investment. Absolutely. Uh, and then the second is your assumption of, of no silver bullet, that you have to make a very comprehensive set of investments. Exactly. So let me move now to something that Kellogg is also famous for, which is measurement. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you're trying to break down the systemic barriers. How do you even start to get at measuring and knowing whether you're successful at this? And that's a, a, an interesting proposition. I bet we all continue to think about these issues of measurement and impact. Um, for us, one of the things we did to ensure that we could measure and show success is we identified what we call priority places. And so in, in the United States, we have Michigan as a priority place, Mississippi, New Mexico as three states, and the city of New Orleans. And then we have Haiti, Chiapas, and the Yucatan, and Mexico City. But because we committed to these places as priority places for a generation. So what we've said is for these places, we will be there for at least a generation, however you define that. So that gives us an ability to do longitudinal and uh, local impact studies. We do surveys. We, we keep the community engaged because that's part of how we do our work. The other thing we did was we measured long-term success, so third grade student achievement is a measurement, right? But when you make a grant in year one, you're not gonna see that change in year two or three. It's going to take a while for the transformation. So we also created what we call progress indicators, and it, they were built based on the strategies and how we thought the school fared, enrollment was one of them. So we measure enrollment every year. We measure teacher capacity, uh, how many hours they're in professional development. So there are some indicators that help you understand that you're on the right track until you reach those longer term measures. So we have both in our strategies now. So I love that and uh, I appreciate, thank you for choosing specific locations, which is part of the social capital and community aspect we're talking about here. Tell me, because everyone has to make those kinds of decisions probably in this audience, how do you go about choosing where to invest and as a function of that, where not to invest? Yeah, so our priority places were chosen based on relationships that we had. Uh, because we do believe fundamentally that when you're in doing place-based work, you have to have a level of trust and credibility. And so we chose those because we had decades of grant making in those places prior to those communities. And so there was some strategy. We didn't, didn't just plop into a place. Uh, we had relationships and partnerships and we built on those relationships. But we also fund across the globe. Uh, we do still, about 50% of our funding uh, goes to these priority places and the other 50% is nationwide. And we pick those investments really through relationship building and uh, we receive proposals over the transom and we receive proposals every day. We don't do a lot of RFPs where we say what you should be doing. We receive proposals where you tell us what your inspirations and innovations are, and we pursue those and we fund those and build relationships. So 
what can you tell? What, what, what are the lessons that you're learning? What are the mistakes that you want everyone to know so they don't make it themselves? Yeah. Uh, uh, the one thing I would say is uh, working in this space around racial equity is, is very difficult. Um, and uh, we're dealing with, you know, centuries of a mindset that um, had a different belief around human value. And, and we understand that. It's been a journey for us internally as well as in our funding. So one thing I would tell you is uh, please make sure that you're taking the journey yourself as you are doing this work externally. So at the Kellogg Foundation, our board, our staff, we all go through training. None of us are experts in this field. We take unconscious bias training. We, our board has taken every training that the staff takes, the board takes. And so it's been a learning journey, and the first thing is to acknowledge that we're not perfect, it's a journey. I think the other thing is to find partners. There are many good organizations out there that can help along this learning journey. And the other thing is you, you have to have dialogue. It's all about building relationships. And we have an entire body of work. Uh, we call it our truth, racial healing, and transformation uh, we call it the enterprise. Um, but what we actually do is we fund communities to have these difficult dialogues through processes that we've perfected over decades around healing circles and uh, you know practices that we've learned from our grantees. And now we're funding these com conversations all over the country and they're making a difference. And this information is available? It's available on our website, wkkf.org. Uh, there's the entire description of that uh, particular body of work. There's an implementation guide for communities to take this on with or without funding. And there, there's a communication guide, a conversation guide, for two individuals to just sit down and get to know one another a little bit better. Before um, we move to questions, uh, you've used an example domestically. I know there's a lot of people who come from outside yes. of the US. Can you give us an yes. example of Haiti, Brazil, yes. something that you've done? Oh, oh my goodness, I could talk all evening. Um, there are two examples. Um, the, the work that we've done in Brazil, I'm just so proud of. I was just in Brazil about three weeks ago. And when we were in Brazil, one of the things, uh, we had an office there for many years. Uh, and as we were leaving and closing our office, we wanted to support work that was just bubbling up in Brazil, and, and that was their work around racial equity. And so about a decade ago, we funded a new organization in Brazil called the Balba Fund. And we actually made um, a $25 million matching gift to Balba, because what we said is, uh, in order for them to build credibility in the racial equity space, it needed to be owned more locally, and it didn't need to be a Kellogg-only initiative. So the matching gift actually in encouraged local givers to join a in this effort. And just this past uh, week, after struggling for many years, the Balba raised $10 million based on our match and brand new local philanthropy. And it's in a moment in Brazil where the fund is positioned to, to really support uh, this journey of racial equity in Brazil. Um, Haiti, the work is going on. We just signed a memorandum of understanding with the State University of New York as our partner, and we are going into uh, a community AKIA, and uh, because of the community engagement, they are building a community center based on the needs of the people, based on their articulation of those needs, and a same thing, creating equity and engagement in Haiti. Last question about you, and then uh, look for audience uh, questions. What values do you bring? What personal values do you bring to the work and to your leadership at yeah. the Kellogg Foundation? So I am from a very large family. Uh, my parents uh, were born in Clarksdale, Mississippi. Uh, 
And so they were, uh, my father was one of those uh, uh, people looking for the warmth of another son. They, he was part of that northern migration to Detroit. And so I grew up in Detroit, one of 10 children, uh, a, a, a family with parents that just beat education into the ground. There was no choice, no option. Uh, so, you know, many of us are college educated, but that, com knowing that um, that commitment was so strong and living in a place where I could see many people who were afforded that type of education excel and do extremely well. Um, and so I have a firm belief that it's in all of us that every person uh, is capable with the right support and love and the removal of barriers and structural barriers that uh, take away opportunities. And so that's what drives me, that's my value, and I, it shows up in everything I do. Wonderful. Well, let's move to the audience. I think we have mic runners. Um, so if you could raise your hand. I see someone over there. If you could just uh, say your name and let us know what you'd like to know. Hi, Maya, Winkles, Maya Winkelstein. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the internal staff conversations that needed to be happen that needed to happen uh, to get to the point where you could do this work externally. And I would love to hear from you, maybe just one or two of uh, what were the the biggest barriers or the the biggest pushback that you got internally and how did you work through that? Okay, it's a great question, thank you. Um, there were many lessons we learned internally, but I'll, I'll tell you one pivotal moment. Um, I mentioned that I started working at the Kellogg Foundation in 1987 and then there was a commitment by our president. Um, and I remember a staff meeting in those early days uh, and I would say at that time, the Kellogg Foundation was probably, you know, 95, 97% white. Um, and uh, as the president began hiring a few people of color, um, a white gentleman stood up in the staff meeting and said, when will it be our turn again in this organization? And I would, and again, I would tell you, we were still at about 97%, but something was moving and there was immediate pushback. Um, and, and the thing is, is we struggled with that because uh, it began our learning journey and we realized that we had to do that work internally. We worked a lot with John Powell, um, and he actually came to Battle Creek and work with our leadership. But the biggest thing we found we had to do to sustain this work was to really keep the board involved. Um, we conducted a survey of our racial equity work internally by social policy research. And one of the things that they named in their uh, recommendations was this concept of needing to create an authorizing environment. And what they said is if you don't have that authorizing environment, the work internally doesn't sustain itself. And that authorizing environment needs to start at the very, very top. And it can't just be a mandate written on paper that there has to be action and engagement from the very, very top throughout. And so we, we took that to heart. And so a lot of our work internally, as I said, involves every member and you know the other challenge we had was the first time we said that one of these trainings was mandatory and a lot of people in the organization was like excuse me uh, nothing has ever been mandatory in this organization and now this is mandatory um, but we got over that everyone had to go we actually followed up on three people who didn't sign up and uh, made sure that they took the makeup class uh, those who called in sick that day got a makeup and now when you come into the organization you go to a week training with WMFDP is part of your onboarding. So there's a lot of things that we've had to just institutionalize, uh, but I think it pays off at the end. 
think the lesson here is don't call in sick at the Kellogg Foundation. <laughs> so, see a hand raised right there. Oh, thanks. Hi, I'm Joan Platt. Hello. Um, and I've actually been involved some with East Palo Alto. Mm -hmm. um, so my questions really kind of stem from that. You commented that you commit to a generation of work in an area. And when I look at East Palo Alto um, over the last, say, 25 years that I'm aware, or 30, the changing demographics in the area must, how do you address that? And I think the other part of it for me is when you talk about racial equity, where does poverty come into your discussions? Mm -hmm. If you don't mind, uh, just because not everyone may know the context, you say the changing demographics of East Palo Alto. Could you just give a sentence more about that so everyone understands? Um, I would just say that there have been a ver variety of cultures that have moved in and through. And so when I first moved to California in 1983, I would have said it was African American. Um, today it's much more mixed than that. And actually African American is a smaller, quite a bit smaller percentage. Mm -hmm. However, the community has still struggled with some of uh, similar kinds of issues that it did in 83. And so, it's and it's and it's much more mixed today. Great. Thank you. I, I actually think the poverty issue is probably playing, or the lower income overall issue plays into that as well. But so I am curious how you work with those kinds of things yeah. in the work you're doing. Yes. Thank you. Um, it's a it's a lot involved in that question. I'm going to try to do a quick uh, overview. Um, so one of the things when we started in this work and we wanted to reach all children and we said particularly those most vulnerable, we looked at some of the work from Dolores Acevedo Garcia and she talked about the double and triple effect of, 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 of different dis, uh, discriminatory characteristics. And so, you know, first of color, but when you're of color and you're also faced with poverty and then on top of that a single parent household and you can list several, but what she talks about is the compounding and the concentration of these issues in a location and what it does to development. And so we've studied a lot of that and we understand that. And, but one of the things we've done in our work is we must be fully inclusive because at the bottom line we're all human beings and so um, all of our work hasn't been about you know black or white but it's been about everyone in the community wh whomever you are and we've sought to find them from all different uh, diversities uh, but I think the next step of this work is to actually work across those demographics and bring those communities together because this isn't an issue of just um, white and everyone else. There are these mindsets that exist where there is uh, tension between blacks in the black community. There's tension between black and brown. And so where our work is heading is really creating the space, regardless of the demography, to really think about um, how do you create dialogue across people? and how do you make everyone feel whole, valued, and participatory in an engagement strategy that leads to transformation. So yes, we deal a lot with those issues, but what we found is we had a choice of just saying diversity or saying race, and we found you had to name race as the, the fundamental structures that have been, you know, uh, persistent in some of these communities and is all of the others. Uh, thank you. As uh, we discussed uh, before we got on here, I'm on the board of the Meyer Foundation in Washington, D.C., which is taking the same steps that you took and having worked in urban areas in many different cities. Um, I want to thank you for being a beacon 
but also providing the cover for so many of us to take these few steps because as you've mentioned over and over again, these are difficult steps. And so I'm glad that you feel so strongly about the Courage Award that you got because truly it was courageous to be the first one to step out there. On behalf of all of us, thank you for your time and the work you're doing. Thank you all.